if we understand the, the physiological stress needed to induce hypertrophy, then we can back calculate what we have to do training wise or what matters or what doesn't matter or what's going to affect each other mm -hmm. to get the desired adaptation. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bletz out here with Oh, shit, we're going. Andy Galpin, Kenny Kane. This man was not prepared. Not at all. I was not ready for Dude, class. Uh, he was sleeping again. Sleeping. <laughs> again. Me or Andy? Is Andy part of the sleeping Well, I thought it was over 40, but I guess I was wrong. You've, ju you've just aged Andy. Uh, yeah. He my, came uh, up seven years. My time to sleep, mm, ten, no, one to two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, goodbye, Natasha. <laughs> She's <laughs> like... Unreal. Ashley's been pissed for years. Well, we talked about that the other day with uh, Dr. Kirk Parsley. We were talking about uh, guys with more, you know, men no normally can fall asleep more quickly. Oh. Yeah. More muscle mass. There's a... Uh, more, more adenosine, is that what he said? Oh, yeah. 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 That's the thing that, uh, that's what caffeine does, by the way. So oh, yeah. That's why caffeine activates the central nervous system is it competitively binds to the same thing that adenosine binds to. Adenosine is what puts you to sleep. Oh, uh, okay. So it binds to that place and it doesn't allow that to happen. So you... Are, that's how it has a central nervous system effect. Oh, right on. Yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. I, I had no idea that it was actually like a a, a very common kind of gender specific thing. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if that's actually gender specific or it's just muscle mass specific. And guys just happen to that's typically have more I muscle think, mass per a, body weight. Yeah, you're saying muscle mass specific, and yeah, men just happen to have more muscle. Well, mass. you know why adenosine yeah. puts you to sleep? You guys, you know, you two at least know yeah. what adenosine is, right? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I remember. Why would we be here? <laughs> Dr. Galvin, jeez. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate. Right. So when you break that up, that's where you get your cellular energy from, right? So it goes from adenosine triphosphate, one, two, three phosphates, to diphosphate, mm -hmm. right? Now you go to monophosphate, and then you remove that last one. Now you have your free adenosine, right? You're just saying that because you saw the Kirk Parsley episode already. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, said, he said the exact same thing. Oh, did he? Right. Yeah. Yeah. ATP. No, yeah, so yeah, ATP. Yeah, we recorded yesterday. Yeah. So when yeah. adenosine levels Don't are super high, like that. that means you're low <laughs> on energy. That means it's sleep time. Oh, uh, cool. Mm. Yeah, that's why. Is that what you tell Natasha? <laughs> <laughs> My adenosine's high. <laughs> Not exactly. 99. Sorry. All right. heavy. Folks, we're going to be talking about uh, hypertrophy today. What's that? Building muscle. How do you make the muscles bigger? And uh, luckily enough, we have a real-life muscle physiologist on the show. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. It, it, it's Dr. Andy Galvin. Oh, yeah. It's Andy. Oops. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be uh, – what direction would we want to take this? Well, because we, so, we talk about building wow, muscle good, a lot. I mean, good job like, set, starting this so up. Good. We only I mean, spent an hour it's setting a, this it's up. It's a strength and conditioning show. We're talking about building muscle. It's like it's probably every third episode. Well, we're going to talk about the three mechanisms yep. that that right. need to be in place to build <laughs> muscle mass and anti Dude, We just talked and, about this an hour ago. And Andy, Andy brought it up, and we were all like, "Yeah, we know what those are." <laughs> um, so we were going I mean, to. I've got my three mechanisms. You got your three <laughs> mechanisms. That's right. So we, we're gonna we're gonna hash and see if we can guess what they are. We're gonna start the show which, off. Which with I, feel, I feel very good about. I think I think I can make that uh -oh. happen. What, what do you what, think? What, what, what do you guys think they are? No, no. I'll, I'll, since since I do two. think I know what they are. I've got two: hope okay. and luck. <laughs> hope and luck. <laughs> hope and luck. That's what I'm betting on. In prayer. In prayer. Prayer. In prayer. How am I gonna get bigger? Oh, what do you man. Got? I want to see. I want to hear Lock. blood cells before. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Fuck, I don't even want. I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> <laughs> like, I just know that I'm going to be so much different. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, there's different varying degrees. Are we talking about, we talking about cellular mechanisms? It doesn't matter, but yeah, that would be a good start. Oh, shit. No, I pass. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm pretty sure I have a good idea over there. So um, tell, me, tell me if I'm going down the right track. Are you talking about like mechanical stress? That would be one of them. Okay. Aww. Okay. So one other track. Okay. So mechanical stress. Um, uh, something about uh, metabolic stress. Um, that would be like two. Like anaerobic glycolysis type stress. That something something along those lines ish. Okay. Yeah. You're in the ballpark. Okay. Uh, and then something around uh, damage, like tissue damage. Ding 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 ding. Boom. Yeah. You've got a winner. You bet. We're done. See you next week. That's Good night. it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Make sure you do you that. Sure you You'll be good to go. At a fourth. At a fourth, which is, would be prayer. <laughs> uh, way two scoops away. That's, that's number four. Always no. Uh, there's actually 
a couple of competing thoughts on that. So that would be one of them. And that was actually championed by, uh, well, I don't know if I want to say champion, but I'll give a lot of credit to Brad Schoenfeld. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys know who Brad yeah. is. And right. if, if you don't know who Brad is, you need to go look him up. He's uh, He publishes the most amount of research in the planet by far on muscle hypertrophy. Right. So fantastic. He's he's pretty active on uh, Facebook especially, so I would really, really seek him out. And he, he wrote a really nice review article a few years ago that outlined this. So I would really encourage you to, if, if you actually like this stuff, go read that paper. It's fairly easy to read even for a non-scientist. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually just called Mechanisms of Skeletal Muscle Hypertrophy or, or something like that. I saw you just put out a book as well, just all, all about hypertrophy. He's got several books out, actually. I okay. think the original one was Max Muscle Plan, and this one is Optimal Strength the Hypertrophy Programming or something like that. Mm, okay. So he's got, and those are like Amazon books. Those are not um, science books, really. They're, they're practitioner friendly. You'd find them at Barnes and Noble, kind of books. So very, cool. very easy to read. Um, he's speaking all over the world, so he he needs to get that credit because he really just does a tremendous amount of research in this area. And, I, and I'm going to basically reiterate a. a regurgitate a lot of the things that he's wrote. So mm -hmm. um, he needs to get that credit. But on the opposite side of him is a guy named Stu Phillips in Canada. Mm -hmm. And Stu is the same thing. Um, a little bit more of a, molec a lot more of a molecular-based scientist. So he actually does biopsies and measures protein synthesis rates and things like that, where Brad just measures actually like how much bigger you got physically. right? So a little bit different outcome. Uh, but he, he's got a different idea that it's really motor unit recruitment-based. Mm -hmm. But really... I don't really see it being that big of a difference, honestly, from a practitioner, uh, because the whole idea about uh, the reason we need to understand this is then we can, if we understand the the physiological stress needed to induce hypertrophy, then we can back calculate what we have to do training wise, or what matters, or what doesn't matter, or what's going to affect each other mm -hmm. to get the desired adaptation. So whether you're talking about Stu's m activation of more motor units or Brad's three mechanisms it's really going to get you to, to a fairly similar place training-wise. So yeah. The methods may look similar, but th what they're saying, the mechanisms of right uh, that's happening at the at the base, they may disagree on that or they may think it's something different, but it yeah. looks the same to the coach. It will look yeah. exactly the same, but it would look similar. Yeah. Well, like like maximum muscle tension yeah. and maximum motor unit recruitment might still fall into exactly. just lift really, really heavy stuff really, really fast. <laughs> yes, exactly right. 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 So the thing you do to maximize muscle tension would be the, also the thing you would do to maximize motor unit recruitment. Right. So it would be. So what, what's motor unit? So the motor units, the way that your muscles contract is, is information comes from your central nervous system, which would be your brain, brain stem, and spinal, spinal cord. And that all comes from these big nerves, and those go out to smaller nerves, and then we kind of start branching our way through the body, right? Mm. So a motor unit is one of these, these alpha motor neurons and all the individual muscle fibers that it innervates. And this is like one of your most class book, classic textbook physiology definitions. Like, what's the definition of a motor unit? Mm -hmm. I guarantee I could have thrown that to both of you, and you would have been like, boom. You could have re That's one of the ones you're going to get hammered on, like every physiology student in the country. Constantly. Day one and day 365. Right, yeah. It's, yeah. it's always there. And so what that basically means is all of your individual muscles are comprised of probably millions of individual fibers or cells. Mm -hmm. Right, and so not all those cells are innervated by the exact or activated by the same nerve. It would it would actually be disadvantageous for you if, if you did that. You just lock up. You would lock up. You wouldn't be. You wouldn't have controlled <laughs> movement, right? Yeah. You couldn't be very very specific with how you move. That's so, why robots move the way they do. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's actually literally exactly yeah. why, right? The, you have maybe two or three nerves activating their leg mm -hmm. as opposed to the. Th Thousands. thousands that you would have. Yeah, they, they have a couple right. motors and they have a couple of, of uh, wires yeah. running, but we have thousands. Millions. 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 Right. <laughs> right. Whoa. So if you yeah. take just one muscle, one of your biceps muscles, you've got all these things going on there, uh, all these neurons going on, and you can use mine as a demo because they're so large. <laughs> <laughs> Zooming in. <laughs> Zoom in really far, please. <laughs> Don't show perspective in the background. <laughs> you Photoshop that? <laughs> um, and so you, what you would have is, is a bunch of the, uh, neurons going in to activate maybe three fibers over here, maybe one activates 30, and the more muscle fibers in a motor unit, the more force and power that that total muscle can generate. The less it has in it, the more specificity of movement you get. Mm -hmm. So more, this, The more fine motor control, like being able to use your fingers to play the guitar. Exactly, right? And so if you look at something like your eyeball, you might have, say, three or maybe ten fibers in a motor unit, mm -hmm. but your glute, you might have 10,000, mm -hmm. right? Because, like, what's your glute have to do? Like, on, off, on, off, on, <laughs> off, right? Mm -hmm. Did you get that, Hunter? Yeah. <laughs> Try that again. 
<laughs> I don't know if Natasha's gonna be happy with. <laughs> right, well, yeah, and he's always shrug. he's always getting up in trouble on the show, <laughs> especially with these glutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> Anyone that's tuned in at the beginning is already gone. Oh, like, so way gone. Back. And you saw the Facebook live. <laughs> oh yeah, that yeah, was leading up to this. It was even fail. worse. <laughs> uh, yeah, so th- that's basically what it is. Um, so we we don't have to have all three of those mechanisms, right? You don't have to have metabolic fatigue or metabolic stress. Hmm. You don't have to have mechanical tension, and you don't have to have mechanical muscular damage. Mm. But you need to have at least one of those three, and probably if you can get yourself in a situation where you have two of three, mm. then you're going to be in a really good spot, or three of three would be tremendous too. Mm-hmm. Right. So what yeah, I, I mean, I remember a few years ago you were saying, oh, you don't have to have damage no. for growth. And I was – and yeah, which means you don't that, have to be sore. Up, yeah. to that, up to that point, I was like – I totally believed that that was one of the main reasons. Mm. And right. I, it was like, oh, I don't have to be sore. So there's no relationship at all between the level of sore, sore you are though. and I how. Kept getting sore. <laughs> of course, like I'm s- amaz- massively sore right now, um, <laughs> but you don't have to have soreness to to cause uh, growth. You just simply have to activate growth. Mm-hmm. Now, the way that it, the reason it kind of works is when you do the type of training that does make you sore, that tends to also be the type of thing that that causes growth. Mm-hmm. So there is is sort of a, a loose relationship between those things. But if you just maximize soreness, that does not maximize right. growth. Right. That's not going to put you it's in your spot. More correlated right. than, right. than cause and effect. There's an association, but there's a there's a wall. There's a there's a cliff where you drop off. Where you're like, right. this is no longer productive. In fact, it can be detrimental if you're out for a month because you're so sore. So like it, a, right. a German volume training. Yeah, some. I mean, some could handle it, right? If right. you have a really, 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 really extensive training history and and re- you recover well, uh, you might be able to do that kind of a load. But most people. Uh, three sets of ten at sixty percent of their max is going to make them very. I mean, the people that you work with, right. like, that's going to crush them, yeah. right? You're going to well, be gone works. for a week. It works. I mean, you get stronger doing it, right? And you grow doing yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, ten by ten, that that's probably far excessive. Yeah. So, so practically, since we're talking about sets and reps and all yeah. that for for the three categories, like what are the types of training that that give you that that type of stimulus, which hopefully hopefully in this conversation spurs some type of growth? Yeah. So I'll actually I want to back calculate this one and I want to throw you two under the bus a little bit. Shit. <laughs> And we'll actually throw you kind of back uh, under later, but <laughs> what, what's the classic textbook programming prescription for hypertrophy? Three sets of 10, like you just said. Eight three, to 12 reps. Yeah. Eight yeah. to 12 eight reps, 12. right? Tens and 12s. Tens and 12s, yeah, right? Between Eights. three and five sets, usually. Right. I mean, at, that's pretty classic. At a mm. load, how, what would the load be? Around 60. 60 to 70. 60 to 70, yeah. Okay, and then what would the rest interval be? Like a minute, minute and a half. This would be the, the time seconds. you take yeah. between sets, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Brad's work has actually quite clearly shown that a lot of that's not not the case at all. In fact, what he's shown several times, number one, that most of the time you can get equal hypertrophy with two to three minutes rest in between sets. Mm-hmm. Right now, have you ever done, I know you all three have, I know it, I guarantee it, I personally know you've done it, I personally mm-hmm. know you've done it, I'm sure you have. But do that three sets of 10, just go do three sets of 10 of your squat, 70%, go 65%. Now, most of you training are probably thinking like super easy, right? Now do it with 45 seconds rest in between. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That yeah, gets really hard, no. like really fast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Your, your reps are going to go from, from, yeah. from 12 to 10 to 8 yeah. to 6. Like, to, to pretty 4, quick. yeah. Yeah. Like, on the you're floor. You're going to fall off. Unless you're like crazy, crazy, crazy conditioned. Right. Or you're used yeah. to doing it, things like that. But most yeah. people, we always say that rest intervals are like the forgotten child of programming. Because mm-hmm. like no one just pays attention to them. Yeah, they don't write them down usually. It's like, ah, oh, just re- either either don't rest at all or just I don't know, rest until you feel like you're good. All right. I would say when I started weightlifting... That's when I stopped timing my rest intervals. Right. When I was doing the nine years I was training before I discovered weightlifting, yeah, 60 or 90 seconds almost all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. go away from it, right? Yeah, I got away from it because I wanted more optimal. I want to lift the heaviest load possible every time cool. or, or the fastest. So there's no mm-hmm. doubt having a very tight or short rest interval, whatever it happens to be, a minute or so, plus or minus, mm-hmm. it's a completely different training session in three minutes. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Now what he was we we what we classically would say is okay, the because of what we originally thought was happening with the acute hormone response. Um, now that we know that it actually doesn't matter. So for example, we could do a uh, this is actually what might blow some minds. The acute change in testosterone specifically after exercise probably plays no role at all in hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. So this is one thing people are like, oh, you got to make sure you you jack up testosterone. This is why you do this type of thing. You want to get this big growth hormone surge. That doesn't actually change anything with hypertrophy. Probably is playing almost no role in inducing hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. 
Now, the reason why exogenous testosterone works is because now you're talking digits fold increases in testosterone. Yeah. No, not, it's not, a, not, not for a, a short peak. Yeah. It's all day long, too. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's jacked up there. So not it's a 15% increase. Right. It's a 5,000. If, if you're doing it right. Right, right. <laughs> and you've gone way past physiological numbers now. Right. Right, but it is, it's tremendously effective for that reason. Mm -hmm. And so w once they started to realize that, they're like, wait a minute, so what if I extend the rest interval to three minutes? Well, what do you lose when you go to three minutes? Time. Well, right, okay. <laughs> your workout's three minutes longer, I guess, right? Yeah. But what mm -hmm. would, how would that feel different if you did well, that? Your, same your metabolic stress is going to be yeah. lower. You're going to be able to filter out all your metabolites yeah. that so were produced from the first set. You're so recovered. what do you what do you gain? You oh, you recover. So what happens mm -hmm. to then the other, the next set or the set after that? You just get a better set. Yeah. Like you're you're more rested. You can do more reps. And so instead of doing 12, 10, 8, 6, now you're doing you know, 12, 12, 12, 12, or, or what have you. So you get more volume. Yeah. You're probably doing faster reps because you're not as tired, so you get a little more little more tension because you're contracting more forcefully. Right. You could have put on five more pounds maybe or five more percent, whatever, right? Movement qualities and probably so, sustains. Yeah, True. right. Hopefully, right? Hopefully. <laughs> That'd be the goal. And so what did what happened when we played with just that one variable rest interval? We've shortened rest interval, which means metabolic stress went right. way up. And so we lit ourselves up on that metabolic stress for sure. That one is checked. Okay, mechanical tension, meaning heavy. Did it stress the connective properties sufficiently where they really had to work to connect? Okay, well, now because I've had to shorten my rest interval, I got tired. I had to take right. five pounds off. And now, yeah. you know what? I got to the next set. I realized I only got seven reps this time. I got to take 10 pounds off mm. or a plate off. Mm. And so mechanical tension started to leak down. So I gained metabolic stress, but I lost mechanical tension. My damage might be about the same, mm -hmm. right? When I do the opposite, when I add breast, I lose probably almost all of the metabolic stimuli, but I keep the, vo the, the load really high or the volume, depending on what I want to do or some combination. Right. Mm -hmm. And so why do both of those work equally effectively, which is what Brad's research showed? Mm -hmm. Because we, we realize we've got these three mechanisms, and I, I can You're give one and gain the, the other one. Right. Hitting two of the I'm three just deciding which one I want to gain. So that's the mm -hmm. key, is hitting two of the three pretty much at all times. Uh, It'd be nice. For, for yeah. all intended stimuli. It'd be yeah. nice to gain all three a little bit. Right. right to check, and that's where you're probably going to get the most. But if you get two of the three really hard, if two are way yeah. up there, and maybe you could focus on two one day and then have a rotation in your training program. So, exactly. Yeah. And so this is when you have to pay attention to, like a lot of the people you work with have multiple goals. They want to gain right. strength and yeah. they want to gain muscle mass. Okay, now I understand this. I can put you in the situation that gets you the hypertrophy box. But what's the other one you want checked off? Oh, okay, you want strength. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give you more rest so we can keep the load higher. Right. And yeah. you'll be able to work a little bit more on strength while you're doing that. Yeah. Right. And so it allows you to understand these adaptations. Now you can pick the specific way you manipulate them based on the other things that are going on in your program. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the rationale for having like your first movement of the day being being a, like a heavier type set. So say you're squatting and you wanted to you want to put mass on your lower half and, and you also want to get stronger. So you know you build up to a one rep max and then you take off ten percent and you mm -hmm. do three sets of three or whatever you're gonna do, uh, or five sets of two or or something where mechanical stress really is the goal with appropriate rest intervals, three to five minutes of rest and all that. Mm -hmm. And then your next set, then now you're doing, you know, you're doing walking lunges for, for five sets of eight right. or something like that. So you had you had the high tension stuff and then you had a little more volume or maybe maybe it's four sets of 12 or whatever you want to do. So you had more metabolic stress in the in the lunges. You had the mechanical tension from the squats and there's a little bit of crossover a little bit with, with each one of those things. But then as far as mechanical uh, or not mechanical, as far as a tissue uh, trauma, right. you're going to yeah, get yeah, yeah. sore from both of those things. That's kind of going to be thrown in there, but you, you focused in this sh short, simple example on mechanical stress for the first movement and then right. metabolic stress for the second movement. And then, again, the, the tissue damage is kind of sprinkled in there. You're probably going to be sore. But you wouldn't maximize yeah. tissue damage like you would if you did something like 10 by 10. Mm -hmm. Where you're going to get just amazingly sore, but tens the, the strength will be very, very low because the load has got to be so low, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Where that's really going to give a lot of muscular damage. So if someone asks, would, would that type of training work? Yeah, of course it would. It just wouldn't do that. And so another thing that Brad did, which is really clever, is he started to look at our, our, our volume number. So what's our optimal repetition per set? Because that's, again, our textbook mm -hmm. says 8 to 12, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So he started to look at, okay, 5 to 8 or so compared to 20, 25. Mm -hmm. 25, 30 reps per set, and again found equal hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. Right when you started like, okay, well, why is that possible? Equal hy hypertrophy, but probably not equal strength. So that doesn't mean equal everything. Right. I wouldn't exactly think. Right. 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 So right. Okay. Exactly right. So who got stronger? Right. The group that did the five to eight reps, right? right? right. Equal hypertrophy, right. but this group got way stronger. Mm -hmm. And so again, you have to understand. Well, what happened? What did you get more of with the 25 to 30 reps? 
Mm-hmm. You got a lot more of the, the metabolic stuff, right? Yeah. That's gonna you're gonna be that's the pump, right? That is yeah. the pump the that end, we talk about. Yeah, that's game. why bodybuilders can be can be big but not strong. Even if even if they're benching four hundred pounds, Wait. like they're they're not strong in this for this conversation, like compared to benching eight hundred pounds. Like right. they're not powerless for strong, even if they're three hundred pounds of muscle, they have some strength. But yeah, but yeah, they're they're doing mostly volume in a lot of cases. I'm stereotyping here in well, a lot yeah. of ways. But but the metabolic stress they do get is Affords Absolutely. them the ability to get very, very, very big, mm-hmm. even if they're not focusing specifically on strength. Right. You won't find a bodybuilder on the planet who only does sets of 8 to 12. Mm-hmm. You would never see that. They're going to go up to sets of 50, up to sets of 100. Right. And they're going to go some singles. They're going to go some triples. They're going to play in that whole spectrum. I mean, you can, we've all seen the Ronnie Coleman leg press video, right? Oh, jeez. <laughs> right? Well, whatever. I don't, all his videos are awesome. Right? Like, Amazing. The old, like, unbelievable, like, that, that's the name of the DVD set, like, yeah. from back in the day, like, the unbelievable Ronnie Coleman video where he's doing, like, Ben over Rose with, like, 495, and he's, <laughs> he's just, like, he's just kind of rock, rocking him out. Yeah. That, that, whole, that whole set is awesome. Exactly. <laughs> he's not weak. No. He's way he's stronger strong than shit. all of us, right? You mm-hmm. you cannot have that muscle, that kind of muscle, without being weak. Right, coming it's, out of powerlifting, it's physically impossible to add muscle mass and not add strength. So, can you take two steps back and just kind of talk? Because, like, where we train, we do a lot of tens and twenties at our yep. gym, but we also do a lot of fives and threes as well. Yeah. And so, people's experience is very vast within that. And so, obviously, we're going to bias, especially when we're doing tens. Like right now, we're or recently we've been doing uh, three by tens um, at floating between sixty and seventy percent, mm-hmm. uh, various lifts, front and back, just as a example. But we also pepper in periodically twenties and yeah. use that systematically. Now, that's a very different experience. Um, and and the endocrine experience, it, you, I mean, you f- it feels oh, yeah. just from a practitioner standpoint that those feel like very different things. So can you backtrack just one sec and kind of like clarify the point that you were just making, but using that as a case example? Yeah. So sets of ten versus sets of twenty. Yeah, or even five. Something just like that experience. Okay. I mean, tens are hard oh, enough. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we're sprinkling in with 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 the set to ten, just as a reference. We're using basically three minutes as rest, plus okay. or minus. But we're we're hitting that sort of spot versus our twenties. Yeah. Um, so and we have used like we've done twos on a two minute with a little metabolic piece mm-hmm. at eighty five percent, accumulating sixteen reps over eight minutes or over sixteen minutes, which is another technique we use. But just yeah. hit those first two if you don't mind. Yeah. So the heavy one. Right, you're going to get a lot of mechanical tension. You're going to that. This is heavy, right? Right. You're absolutely going to get that thing. Uh, you're still going to get a little bit of a metabolic stress on there, but it's not going to be killer. Uh, and it's probably going to give you a little bit of damage too. Like lifting that heavy for most of us, unless you're 23, nothing gets you sore anymore, right? Like when you're that age, like every, <laughs> nothing makes you tired. You're like, oh, I'm super sore for an hour, and you feel great again. And the rest of us are like, I'm super sore for three weeks, <laughs> <laughs> right? Think you don't recover as fast, but that's going to get you the the strength end of it and a little bit of the muscular damage of it. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, it's probably you don't have to check in at the beginning there, mm. but boy, if you want to keep going, well, you feel the burn at rep twelve, right. but you're trying to get eight more, yeah. and you have to be able to get that pump and to keep moving, even though the load. And this is the classic, like you've done so many reps where you can't even feed yourself anymore because your arm stops working, right? <laughs> like, I, how can I not lift a pound? Mm. I started with a hundred pound presses. I did them to like now I can't move the barbell. Mm. Right, and so you you have enough strength there, no problem. It's just, are you really willing to keep pushing and getting there? So that's going to be excessive metabolic damage. Mm -hmm. And if if we take that even further, this is when the really exciting blood flow restriction comes in. Mm -hmm. And this is the mechanism behind how that works. So this would be if you you wanted to take a voodoo band Mm -hmm. and just wrap it around your bicep or something, Mm -hmm. and then you just train with it. Well, you would actually, you only use maybe 20% of your one rep max with that. Yeah. So you're doing bicep curls with 20% of your max, and you do 30 reps or something, and the burn in your arm is something like you've never felt before. Yeah. Now, you're not going to have muscular tissue, um, uh, mechanical tension. That's not heavy. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get a tremendous amount of damage, though you, you can get pretty sore from it. Yeah. But you're getting a whole bunch of metabolic stress. Right. And that's why blood flow restriction is so effective for hypertrophy training. Yeah. And you're seeing a lot of people doing it now. Um, a lot of athletes are doing it. Mm-hmm. This is actually one of the biggest things that, that uh, we're working on with NASA going up. Mm. Like, this is maybe the real, this is going to oh, be yeah. potentially the answer for that problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you can't induce weights up there. It's just such an engineering nightmare. You guys know, the full yeah. depth episode. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, that's an interesting interesting thing for, uh, like, doing that type of ischemic training is really popular in, in, in some circles, especially kind of in the bodybuilding world where yeah. uh, it's really easy on your joints. If you're only yep. lifting 20% of your max. Like, you're not stressing your, in this, you know, if you're doing curls or whatever, like, your elbow's not really taking a lot of stress. Mm-hmm. Um but in the in the astronaut example, like how do you? I don't know if we need to go down the strap, but hold. But how do you do that type of training for all muscle groups? 
Oh, it's, it's super like, easy, actually. It, it's easy on your arm, I'm wondering how course. you get that to your perineum. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just have a big cuff for your quad. I'm training my taint today. <laughs> yeah. Sneather training. I need a compression. <laughs> um, it's actually... Just I'm buying that domain. Sneathertraining.com. <laughs> <laughs> just think of it as if having you had compression shorts on. Okay. So they basically have that where, where the compression fills, uh, goes around the entire quad. And then you can just like basically turn it on, and it inflates, and it cuts off a lot of the blood flow there. And then you can do body weight squats, you can do hinging, you can do lunging, step ups, whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. And now you're getting a similar effect. It's not perfect, but you're going to be able to get your arms and your quads. And if you do that, and then you do a bunch of movement based things where you're moving in different areas, that's going to get a lot. Yeah. Because remember that metabolic stress is not just affecting the exercising muscle itself. Mm-hmm. You got it going through the entire system. Yeah. So it's going to be most influencing the exercising muscle itself. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Shouldn't turn that motorcycle down. Sorry. Sons of anarchy. So, right here. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I got a question for you. When we were back at University, University of Memphis, uh, you know, Rick Bloom was doing some stuff with ischemia reperfusion. Like, what, what is? Yeah. How does the reperfusion aspect of that mm-hmm. affect this situation? That, like, when you uncuff and you get the, all that blood flow flowing back in. Yeah. Wh- wasn't there some type of mechanism there where there was causing some type of change? I don't. I don't remember what exactly what he was doing. Well, there's a lot of mechanisms there. Mm. Um, it, it's really the same thing. The what. Look, all you're really doing is simulating exercise. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the same thing, right? It's the exact same occlusion happens. You'll need, depending on the movement you're doing, anywhere between 30 and 70% of your one rep max on to completely occlude a blood flow to an area. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about the blood. I'm okay. talking about normal, uncuffed just from training. The, just in the contraction. The contraction pressure, right? So mm-hmm. 70% or lower is probably going to completely block off blood flow. So then when you stop, the blood flow comes rushing back in. Mm-hmm. So it's really the exact same mechanism. So yeah. what you've got is this massive buildup of waste product in the tissue mm-hmm. itself, yeah. carbon dioxide, uh, adenosine, like all these things are getting way high, right? AMP levels are getting way up. And these are metabolic signaling, uh, signal life, signal life? Signalized. Signals. Signals. Just go with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one would have known. I could have rolled Signal right through Signal and stimuli? No. Mashed stimuli. together. People right? are going to start saying it now. Stimuli. stimuli. Um, all <laughs> these things are they're activating a whole sequence of gene. Uh, you have Foxos going on. All these. these Foxos. Yeah. <laughs> these proteolytic, <laughs> proteolytic uh, actions are, are happening. Metabolic ones. Um that are saying, okay, all kinds of damage in here. You've got acute inflammation, oxidative stress. This is a real problem. And then when that stuff gets cleared out, then you've got the signal that comes in and says, let me fix all of that. Mm-hmm. And so then the opposite starts rushing back in. So you've got everything from the nutrient level, from glucose coming back in, all the way down to gene expression happening mm-hmm. that are causing that whole cascade. Oh. So I don't know if there was a particular protein you were, you were remembering or referring to or anything or... No, I don't know. I just didn't remember what the hell he was doing, and I was curious if you did. He was, he was <laughs> if it had any relevance to our conversation. I think he was looking at nitric oxide, um, particularly, but I can't remember. Or it's oh, nitrite, yeah. nitrate. That does that does ring a bell. Yeah, that's right. Which is one of the things that's that is in a lot of the pre workout supplements these days. Yeah, it used to be. They they Wait. fixed that now. They've engineered back around. It's to, a vaso, what, vasodilator. Yeah, that's what right. they're doing arginine stuff for. It's because it's more bioavailable. But that's where that's all coming gotcha. from. Let's yep. take a break real quick. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, how conditioning plays a role. Or it. can it? Yeah. I wrestled in uh, high school. Um, picked up some jujitsu after that. But between those two, I started working out with a couple of meatheads. Um, you know, doing bench press curls, things like that. Uh, never doing legs, um, you know, the standard gym guy workout. Never really got anywhere with it, you know, just enjoyed my time at the gym, you know, kind of socializing. I've done CrossFit since 2009, and I started playing with the barbell just a little bit, you know, doing some overhead squats and uh, front squats, thrusters, you know, basic Metcon. I really shied away from, from doing strength training because um, it was intimidating. You know, I'd never been a strong guy. At 130 pounds, I could always play that size card. I could always say, okay, yeah, I clean, you know, 220, but come on, I'm 130 pounds. But I've been crossfitting since 2009, so it was time uh, for me to, to nut up and, and do something different. And so, you know, as an athlete, I was like, what is the, the next step for me? You know, it's time to gain some weight and time to find some strength. I'd say the biggest thing that sparked me to do the muscle gain challenge was a simple workout that I did with a buddy. It was 12.96 of 
185 pound power cleans and ring dips. Like, oh, that's a 90 second workout. <laughs> um, you know, he crushed it. And it took me 12 and a half minutes to be put down that, that hard by a workout. It was really like a blow to me. So, you know, that was the evolution for me. It was like, I have to get stronger. You know, I, I don't feel capable at all. The volume absolutely blew me away. I had no idea what I was in for volume wise because I, this is coming from somebody who lifted, you know, Monday and Thursday. That was the days I lifted, that was it. You know, one lift, snatch on Monday, clean on Thursday, I might squat on Saturday. It was hard, but being stuck where I was, I was ready for a challenge and just something, something different. The conditioning and the muscle gain challenge is, is perfect complement to the program. It's, it's short and intense workouts that are really there to help you kind of maintain your abilities. You know, your ability to do pull-ups and, and muscle-ups and things like that, all those needs are addressed. And so, you know, a lot of people think, again, with a muscle gain challenge, oh shit, I'm gonna gain 20, 30 pounds. Um, my pull-ups are gonna suck. I won't have handstand push-ups. And that's all bullshit. Um, because they, they make you do those things multiple times a week. Um, all the skills that you, you know, need or value will remain intact. Before the muscle gain challenge, my nutrition was, was pretty zone paleo because I was so into CrossFit. I think that uh, um, I was underfed, you know, for breakfast. I remember having three blocks of, of egg whites with uh, some almonds and some unsweetened applesauce. And it was like a three block breakfast. I guess I didn't think about eating for my goals, but food is the most important tool that you can use to get strong. I was wanting to be super healthy and have this zoned out, you know, paleo type diet, um, but I also wanted to be a lot stronger. By abandoning those principles and taking on the proper nutrition, uh, you know, I made a huge change. Just using the knowledge that they give you um, through the Faction Foods Nutrition course and all just the, the tips on, on nutrient timing, when to eat, you know, when to eat what, those things become a habit. And they actually introduce you to habits in the muscle gain challenge. Here's habit one, you know, weigh yourself daily. Habit two, um, eat this after you work out. And, and those habits, I still use them, you know. After the first four weeks, I could tell that I was on the right track. Uh, my first time maxing my back squat during the challenge, I made like a 15 pound PR and it was the first time I'd ever um, squatted, I think 275 pounds high bar. And I was, I was like, okay, this shit works. When I started the, the challenge, I was, I was 130 pounds, had a 2X body weight back squat like on the dot. I think I was 260, 265 on my squat. Um, at the end of the challenge, I was over 150 pounds. I had a 300 pound front squat and a 365 pound back squat. So my squat went up uh, 100 pounds during this uh, muscle gain challenge. Competing in weightlifting was part of, I think, just like a natural progression. If you do this, you know, runners run 5Ks, 10Ks, you know, um, CrossFitters compete in CrossFit competitions and you get into weightlifting and I think it's just a natural progression to want to do um, a competition. My goal is to try to maximize my strength at the current body weight that I'm at now and compete in December at the American Open. And then after that, if, uh, if I feel like I'm kind of maxed out on my, my body weight, maybe bump it up a weight class and kind of relive the whole uh, muscle gain challenge thing, see how far I can take this. Strength helps build confidence and, and a confident person walks, you know, differently than someone who's unsure of themselves. And, um, and, and being strong and just having that whole thing about you, I think, is, is attractive to people. Chicks definitely dig that. Being stronger has absolutely changed me fundamentally and, and, and just the way I think and feel about things. Definitely more patient. I'm nicer, I'm happier, more confident, and uh, I can help move your couch a lot more efficiently now. We're back. We can't be back. The, the, great, the good doctor's on his phone. He's not even paying attention. Hold on, hold on. He's, he's, sorry, he's, I'm tweeting. Texting, texting my bitches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs>
Thank you. I was texting my mom my surprise <laughs> present. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Cool. <laughs> She's one of many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's in the stable. <laughs> I love your mom. Oh man, uh, we've dig never, us out. We've Mike. never had to edit a show before. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Mike's the guy to dig us out of that. <laughs> like, yeah, like, like, of the four of us, he's the one. <laughs> like, how'd that happen? <laughs> well, my appearance like, on this show was short lived. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, guys. It's been great. <laughs> really taking it far this time. It's been right. great being a part of the show. <laughs> so great. so we, we rolled through mechanical tension a little yeah. bit. We, we talked about metabolic stress quite a bit. And then all the all the trauma stuff, all the tissue breakdown stuff was kind of just like, ah, oh, well, it'll be in there a little bit. If yeah. you do a, an insanely high volume, it'll definitely be sore. But uh, we haven't really talked about um, specific mechanisms to induce some type of tissue damage, like like long eccentrics or, yeah. or tempo reps or things like that. So so how, how, do, how do those type of repetitions factor into this? Yeah, so uh, if we actually kind of back all the way up a little bit, this is one of the reasons why I'm never particularly interested in talking a lot about hypertrophy programming because I think it's super easy. You, have, you basically can't screw it up. <laughs> you can go anywhere between like 3 and 30. <laughs> right, right. Like, is that a big enough right. window? For, or actually right. 3 and 100 probably, right. really. Uh, and then this is another one of those examples where, okay, do something that makes you sore. Okay, you probably landed right. Like, okay, what's, what's your answer? Maybe you want to do one set of one, but that one repetition is a 35-second eccentric squat. Yeah. Well, that's probably going to make a lot of people sore, and yeah. that would be enough, right? Because you have mechanical tension the whole time. And so when you start adding things like different tempo, and what I mean by that is the amount of time you spend in the repetition, mm-hmm. right? Well, then that throws the rep scheme numbers way off because right. you could do three sets of five and be very, very sore if that was a 10-second 10 second, 10 second rep, each one of them. That's yeah. why a lot of people like tempo is they can yeah. actually do the math on how much time under the muscle is under yeah. tension right. versus saying three sets of eight. It's like an estimate of how much time you're yeah. actually in the squat. Yeah. Right. So the time under tension thing is, is important too, and that's one of the components to it, but it's not the the overarching has to have happen thing. Like like when we were kind of growing up, that was a big thing, time under tension, right? You have to make sure you control this and count this and stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, we've realized that's probably not a huge deal because mm-hmm. a lot of other things factor in. It's not to say that's unimportant, but it's not probably the king of all things, right. hypertrophy needed for that. Yeah. And what's really interesting about it is, you know, we'll give the classic example of the typical student in my classroom. I, I realize I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably say some un-PC things right now, but this is legitimately based on numbers in my classroom. This is the place to put it, not... Not at the university campus. Yeah, right? Because <laughs> isn't it weird how we're not allowed to actually do that in university anymore? <laughs> anyways. <laughs> place where you're supposed to go to have open thought and discussion, but apparently you offend people. So anyways. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of the times you'll have females that are interested in working out, and they but they don't want to bulk up. Right? Okay, great. And so they're like, well, I'm going to stay light. I'm going to do more reps. I'll do like sets of 15 or sets of 20, nice and light because I want to tone. We're like, great, so you're going to land still just smack down. Well, every time I train, I just bulk up so fast I can't train. Yeah, because you're doing right dead in the middle of that perfect hypertrophy zone, which is your 10 to 12 to 15 to 20. Mm-hmm. You're landing right there, right? Oh, okay, so why don't we go it's the other way? counterintuitive, but right. that, yeah. that, 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 that makes sense why, they're, why they think that's the right thing to do, uh, but it maybe is not the right thing to do if they're trying to minimize hypertrophy. Yeah, they would probably go the other end of the spectrum and put you in a little bit better spot, which is actually heavier for less total time under tension. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And not doing things that are going to make you very, very sore, like massive eccentric stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. So that would make you stronger, but not necessarily bigger. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you could still burn a lot of reps. You could still lose a lot of weight if you wanted to get a workout in. You could yeah. sweat a lot. You could do more circuit or interval-based stuff, throw in conditioning, do other things that are going to allow you to still train really, really hard. You're not going to get really, really sore. You won't get hugely buff. You're going to build a little bit of muscle. You're still moving. Yeah. But you're going to get whatever adaptation that you were there for to burn exercise or energy or, or lose fat or whatever you're trying to, to look for. Mm-hmm. So the, the eccentric stuff is too is another good way. Uh, this is anytime you're lowering or going against the direction of the force and you're specifically trying to extend the amount of time it would take if you just let gravity do its job. Mm. Right? That's going to usually induce a lot more damage than the concentric stuff, which is something that you need to take advantage of. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you imagine pushing a prowler, right? This is a great example of an exercise that's primarily concentric. You're pushing the load the entire time. This is why you can do things like prowler pushes a lot because you can burn a lot of gas on them and you don't get really, really, really sore. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you did things like a lot of box jumps mm-hmm. or jumping off of things and you're not used to it, you're going to get really sore mm-hmm. really fast. Yeah. So High, high-speed eccentrics, like when right. you're landing, tends to make right. people very sore. Right. Like Ex- plyometrics make yeah. you casually sore. Exactly, exactly. So I had a, a, a UFC fighter I worked with years ago 
and he needed this. Oh my gosh! I saw that happening. Uh, <laughs> I was he, like, he's putting his foot up there. One of his big <laughs> issues was, um, you know, just being basically more athletic on his feet, and so he went from never really he, he didn't play field sports as an athlete growing up or anything like that, and he went out and did a bunch of agility work, change of direction stuff on. Mm the field and came back the next day and a couple days later was like my calves, my ankles, like my knee shot. I'm done. I'm so sore. I'm like, yeah, I didn't tell you to do that. Right. That's not what I wanted was an hour and a half of agility drills. I yeah. think, but that caused him, even him, a huge athlete, a lot of hypertrophy in that very small window because he caused a lot of damage. Yeah. Right. With, that was not metabolically taxing at all for him. It was definitely not heavy for him, but it caused a lot of, of muscular damage. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of MMA fighters and other weight class sport athletes where they're they're coming up onto their their event where whether it's a fight or, or whatever yeah. they're typically trying to like you know ratchet their weight down that way oh, they yeah. can make weight and, and they want to be as big as possible in the weight class but typically they're already pretty big and they're trying to like just barely yeah, yeah. skate by on mm. at weigh-ins and so uh things like like pushing a prowler given that it's it's concentric only uh you're, you're not going to get particularly sore because there's there's no eccentrics the the chance of you putting on a lot of weight like hypertrophy wise uh, by doing something like pushing a prowler is really really low so not when they're uh, already pretty trained yeah it helps your conditioning it's it's super super safe it's easy on your joints and then also yeah. it's not going to spur any any mechanism for growth and so if you're trying to be conditioned but you don't want to be sore and you don't want to be tired and you don't want to put on any growth for something like a fight then it's a great option and yeah or other, and other similar things like it are great options if you're a power lifter and you're in a weight class if you're in a weight lifter and you're in a weight class or if again you're just not wanting to put on five more pounds for your upcoming wedding or, or whatever it happens to be but you still want to get strong for all these things it's the same answer either way right mm -hmm. so stick to the primarily concentric based movements this would be things like a deadlift right concentric and then instead of lowering it back to the ground you can just drop it Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That's going to keep you concentric. You're not going to get as sore as if you really took a five second right. time under tension, yeah. right. lowering it and setting it. That's when you're going to be yeah. blown to all kinds yeah. of, of sore. Um, you could do high pulls. Just yeah. don't do the catch. You know, a lot of those things. Uh, yeah. We used to do that a lot before MMA fights. Lots of clean pulls, lots of snatch pulls. Just mm -hmm. pull it and drop it on the ground. Right. Call it good. Move on to the next one. Like jerks mm -hmm. and reset to the back of the rack, drop it back down, go again. Right. Just not. You catch that little bit right there, that's a little bit eccentric when you catch the jerk, but don't take the time to lower it back down to your shoulder, reset, and then go again. Mm -hmm. right? Things like that. So that'll all put you in a pretty good place uh, where you can still have some hypertrophy, and you're going to have some of it, right? If you did that over time, if you did that concentric-based training only for five years, you're going to be bulkier at the end of the five years than you were at the beginning. But that's sure. going to take a long time, and it's going to be a few pounds. Yeah. So it's happening. Right. It's just not at a very, very large scale. And that's what most right. people are, or some people are looking for. Right. If you're still pushing a prowler, like if you're contracting your muscles, there's some mechanical tension there. And yeah. then, if, of course, you push it a long way, like you're going to feel your quads start to burn. So there's some mechanical stress there. Absolutely. But, um, or excuse me, there's some metabolic stress yeah, yeah. there. But um, the chances of you getting really, really big as fast as possible compared to other methods is just really, really low. Yeah. Right. It's not going to happen. Um, but again, this is why even. You'll see people that, uh, like, like bodybuilders, a lot of bodybuilders or anyone in that category, it doesn't matter if they're competing in bodybuilding or anyone that's trying to put on muscle mass, they will all also do things that are in your anaerobic conditioning space. So they will do things like sprint up hills. They'll do stairs. They'll do other things like that. And you're like, why are they doing conditioning? It's like, well, they're, they're trying to get that other end of the spectrum as they had a, maybe a very heavy lifting day to day, and they want to complement that with things that push the anaerobic conditioning things that push the metabolic stress in a totally different way that's way more than you could ever get. I mean, think about it. You ever thrown up from arm day? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Ever thrown up from leg day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. from leg day. Yeah. Right, yeah. for sure. I heard Most a guy cells. threw up from back day. I was like, damn, that's, that's, that's fucking intense. Back you, day? You, yeah. You threw up from back day? No, no, I didn't throw up from oh. back day. It was a bodybuilder. He <laughs> oh said he threw gosh. up like back and biceps day, and he threw up, and I was like, and he's not like out of shape. Yeah, like, yeah. He's a fucking pro, pro, pro bodybuilder. I was like, that is, damn. that's insane to throw up from back day. Yeah, there's yeah. just a, so when you do different movements <laughs> like that, there's a level of systematic insult that caused like really upsetting to the to the entire body where you're like yeah. we've got a projectile, yeah, like get rid of some wow. things. And so we can, you can complement and you can do this is you know why some bodybuilders will do track workouts and they'll maybe even sprint. In fact, one uh, interesting study or couple actually showed that even wind gates, so this is 30 second bike sprints yeah. all out, <laughs> yeah. can still induce hypertrophy in the legs. Huh. Oh yeah. Wow. All right, now this is not probably your go-to mechanism, but it still has that metabolic insult. Right. Uh, another classic example by a couple of colleagues published a paper several years ago that showed equal and even greater hypertrophy in the legs with young and old people after 60 minutes of cycling three days a week. Mm -hmm. 
And you're like, well, what? Like, yeah, they cycled. That's it. They, they weren't taking tests. They weren't getting, having a bunch of protein or anything else that you would normal. Young and old people, well, they were all very, very untrained. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that little bit of a stimulus was enough. Now, if you tested them again six months later, six years later, that's probably not going to be the type of stimulus that causes right. growth anymore. But it did, and, and the number, again, the amount of growth they had was actually at, if not exceeding, what you would predict with right. strength training or normal traditional yeah. route. So I think that what that shows us is we have got a lot more plasticity in our ability to adapt than people realize, mm. and it is not so rigid and set and fast that you cannot do this. You have to do this. Your body, this only works one way. Hypertrophy, conditioning, these adaptations, they come in a lot of fashions, and we all respond very different, and we have to be like, okay, most people, probably want to do three sets of 10 of 8 to 12. Mm -hmm. If you started everyone on the planet with that prescription, it's probably going to work for 80% of the people really well. Mm -hmm. But you're not 80% of the people, you're you. (laughs) So if you're talking about running a gym and you've got 100 people walking in, if you start every single one of them with your your standard textbook Mm -hmm. prescription, that's probably going to save you a lot of guesswork and a lot of time because it will be good for most people. Mm-hmm. But then we go, oh, you know, you're not responding well to that or that's too heavy for you. You're getting way too sore from that or you don't have the technical ability to do those movements. I need you to do whatever reason you're coming up with. Maybe we're going to start you by just pushing the prowler. Okay, we're going to start you with some other prescription. You don't like lifting heavy mentally or you don't enjoy it. It's too hard. What do you like? Oh, you like longer stuff. Okay, we're going to start you over here actually. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like sets of 50. Great. You're going to go over there. Maybe this could be even something like holds, iset- isometrics. I want to do, you get the idea, but now you have options mm. and you can tailor and find out what's hitting them going, oh man, I just love it when we do those wall squats. Okay, great. We're going to do those. We're going to build that into your program or we're going to do what yeah. other thing you do. And so that's also why you can't complain and be like, all oh, these textbooks are so stupid. No, they're not. They're pretty much right. They're just not perfect for everyone. And it is a pretty right. good damn starting spot. Yeah. So uh, even yeah. with the advancements we've learned, we're not regressing and taking that stuff out of the books. Right. We're just now saying you actually have more options than maybe we said before. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I noticed when I when I went from more of like a bodybuilding protocol, did that for years, discovered weightlifting, started doing like no more than three or five reps at a time, and then I, I put on some size. And, yeah. and, on, yeah, yeah, and yeah. specifically yeah. in some muscle groups, which – I had had trouble with previously. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't even trying. I wasn't focused on it. I wasn't thinking about it. I was just trying to move faster, be stronger. And the next thing I know, and with rep schemes that weren't supposed to make me bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I was like, oh, wow, why Why is this muscle group getting bigger? What well, must be from that exercise? That, You know, everything I had read up to that point, I was wrong. Yeah. And it was, mm-hmm. I think there's something to be said. Well, I think I'm a good responder to that yeah. genetically. And then also, if you've been doing something one way for a long time, Absolutely. Just yeah, switch up the switch stimulus. Up, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is why we would encourage people to, if you want a well-rounded training program, you should maybe have each body part doing different things every week, right? And so maybe one of the days your glutes do singles, doubles, triples, something like that. One of the days maybe sets of 8 to 10. One of the days maybe sets of 50 to 100, something like that. And if you don't want to do it every week, maybe every month you change it. Whatever you want right. to do. But, yeah, you're exactly right, Mike, is you want that. If you've been doing the same thing for 10 years in a body part, Maybe change it up. Have you ever done really, really, really heavy bicep curls? Like sets of like, yeah, right? You have, It's crazy. Do those. If you've never done anything besides like 12 or more reps, so your yeah. curls, do as heavy as you can do for threes. Yeah. I remember doing that with sit-ups, actually, yeah. on like those uh, inverted uh, mm-hmm. tables where you hook yeah. your feet in, lay yeah. on your backwards, mm-hmm. and doing as heavy as I could for like three or four. And my abs went yeah. and just ripped in size. Yeah, Couldn't believe it. Right now, you don't want to do that maybe all the time. Most people probably don't want to do that. <laughs> I want some big my, ass abs. My, right? <laughs> my karate instructor used to hang me upside down when I was getting ready for a black belt test. He used to put us on the board and, and hang us upside down on those, on those wall sit up things. Uh-huh. And then dump he'd, water over your face. No, <laughs> but, but he would hammer fist us. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> on the way down, he'd hit uh, you and then yeah, you'd yeah. go again. So, yeah. <laughs> Did it, yeah. Did you fart a lot? A little bit. Then yeah. I we was experimenting with proteins in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Uh, yeah. I mean, the the proteins like, in the eighties and and nineties. Oh yeah, man. yeah, dude. Oh man, the smell was explosive. Might as well just be eating <laughs> chalk and. Yeah. I remember sitting at my kitchen table, just staring at my shirker bottle in high school. <sighs> <laughs> Do I really want this? Uh, <laughs> Close my nose. Like, get down. Like, just, like, okay. And then just being like, I'm not Where doing this. Where are the raw eggs? I'll drink those instead. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like someone now introduces to me a new supplement. I got this new supplement. We've been working on the flavor. What do you think? I'm like, it's great. Every time. It's great. 
<laughs> Compared to what I was drinking in 1997, oh, yeah. this it's is true. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, you, what you mentioned earlier about your muscles specific too, we, we know this very clearly now, uh, we've shown this in our lab, that each of your muscles act has different amounts of these myogenic or growth-inducing proteins, uh, and they express the genes differently too. So what that literally means is you probably need to train some of the muscles a little bit differently. So it's good for my quads, it might not be good for my hamstrings. Exactly. And your and your calf. This is exactly why the calf doesn't grow as much. Right. Uh, it, why it's notoriously difficult to hypertrophy your calf, your rhomboids, things like this. And so what we probably need to do then is start maybe even matching or at least experimenting with, okay, I'm, I'm not getting the growth in my, my traps that I need. I'm not getting the growth in my hamstrings. Why? That's because I'm doing this every time. Well, maybe I need to hit the other than spectrum or do something different with it and try that for a month or six weeks and see what happens. Mm. And my guess is you're going to see a lot better results when you do that because it may need one of the other ends of those three uh, mechanisms of hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was putting together a nutrition course uh, years and years and years ago, uh, I was making a comparison between animal-based proteins and kind of more plant-based proteins, finding complementary proteins like mixing beans and rice and, yeah. and things like that. And so yeah. uh, the comparison I comparison I made at the time was if you're a 200 pound guy and you're trying to get a gram protein per pound of body weight, it's relatively easy to do if you're eating animal proteins. But if you want to do something like mixed beans and rice, like how much food do you really need to eat to get that 200 grams of, of protein total? So it ended up being something like 3,500 calories yeah. just from beans and yeah. rice, yeah. <laughs> like in your day to get the amount of protein you would need to match the, the protein from the, from the animal source. Uh, and then when I, when I dug a little deeper and I look at, looked at the amino acid profile of yeah. the two of the two different, I think I was doing beef and then the, the beans and rice, uh, and I looked at branched chain amino acids, like the leucine content in the in the animal protein was like three times as high yeah, as it yeah. was in the the sure. uh, plant based protein. Which, uh, and you can speak to this probably more than I can about leucine being like like the, the primary amino acid that that stimulates uh, the the cascade of cell signaling pathways and whatnot that lead to muscular growth. And so um, that was just one example of, of many that we could probably come up with why why animal based proteins are likely better in, in some cases than trying to get all your protein from purely animal sources. So. Um, can you riff on that a little bit? Do you know, you know anything about the you know, leucine content and, yeah. and different uh, types of proteins? Yeah, a lot. Uh, what I would say is the f my biggest piece of advice on all of that is you. all of us need to just calm the fuck down. <laughs> <laughs> like, for, for, in particular, me? Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> I mean, that, no, that's a great example of it. Ten years ago, you're just like, let's just look at total protein number, and we'll make all these decisions. See, like, this is why animal-based protein or, is so much better, because look at total protein. And then we started to realize, actually, maybe total protein throughout the day doesn't matter that much for growth. Actually, what matters is how much essential amino acid. And so the old 20 grams, 25 grams of protein per serving is now everyone's like, well, that really doesn't matter, actually. What matters is are you getting your 6 grams of essential amino acid per serving? That's what actually matters. Mm. And then we start folding that back even further and saying, okay, well, let's look at leucine or valine or one of these branching amino acids. And then we were like, okay, leucine is the key regulator. It's it. This is the one turning on the myogenic process. It's turning on growth. Boom. Great. We start giving these big trials of leucine to people and realize BCAAs don't do shit. Damn it. <laughs> all right. And so now we're like, okay, there's Dude, some... I drank all that really bad tasting shit for so long. Right. And it's That's not true. Just... BCAAs <laughs> taste Dude, like shit. so bad. <laughs> Terrible. Right. And that's not to mm -hmm. say they don't do anything. So I'm, I'm probably just infuriated half the internet right there. At least supplement, the <laughs> supplement companies. But, but they, had, <laughs> they have a marginal uh, to moderate effect at best but that doesn't make it right or wrong because what's 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 important there to understand is to step back and ask yourself first well what do i what effect am i really trying to get mm -hmm. if i'm interested in chasing these things that taste like shit and they're 50 dollars a month in serving for a zero to three percent improvement mm -hmm. is that is that worth it or not well for some of you you're like yes and, and i'll say great and some of you are like no then then great and so it's not a work or not work it's defining yeah. what work means mm -hmm. right and it's not going to give you 45 percent growth in a day <laughs> Like yeah. that's not where we're at. And so some of you were like, "Yes, I will take, I will spend a hundred dollars a month on BCAAs, and I'll, if that gives me three percent difference in a year, that's worth it." Dude, some of you are here at three percent, and they're like, "Holy shit, give it to me! Is it magic? Like that's it, amazing." Right. Exactly right. right. Mm -hmm. So it's not a work or not issue. I, that's probably one of the biggest questions I get is BCAAs, and we need a whole other show for me to answer this question. Mm -hmm. But like, do they work or not? And I'm like, yes, every supplement ever works. All of them work. Like, we have to have a whole conversation about what work means, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. how are you operationally defining in that conversation? Right. Well, that that not, have you have you already picked all the other low hanging fruit? It's right. like it's like oh, you're you're not even eating right. whole foods, and you're worried about getting work. BCAAs at this point. This is this could be an issue. Work versus worth is a different question. Is it worth it versus does it work? Mm. Right. Like, that's the question of is it worth it? 
Right. Like, does it work? Well, again, if you're having, if you're 200 pounds and you're consuming 350 grams a day of animal protein, I'm not sure BCAs are going to do anything. Right? Probably yeah, you, not. You tapped are, out. Are you on a lower you're based full. one? Are you, you know, these are all, then, then work matters. Then it yeah. does, it doesn't matter. Are you training a lot? Are you not training a lot? And so that's just one of the things is when we give leucine in cell culture and we give it to rats and, and animal um, models, it seems to be extremely effective at causing hypertrophy. When we give it to humans over big scale, it doesn't seem to be having much of an influence. Hmm. Or now that doesn't mean we change it. And so as we continue to go in the next step, then we're going to start to identify, oh, it's leucine in this format, or it's leucine combined with this, or this is when leucine matters. We're only going to continue to discover because clearly there's some relationship there. Mm-hmm. But we're not at the level where we're like, this is the key one. And it's also sort of, for me, it's pretty stupid to think that your body is so fragile that it's relying all of its muscle growth on this one particular amino acid of which there are so right. many. Mm. And so there's not mm-hmm. one thing. And it's also underplaying your ability to find ways around systems, your body's ability. So don't have enough leucine? We'll figure out a way to get around that. Mm-hmm. We'll do something else. We'll upregulate the signaling mechanism so we don't need as much of this protein to kick this stuff on. Or we'll find another way around it. We'll find a surrogate for it. Uh, some other way we'll get there. So we just we, we need to calm down of being so like, absolutely, <laughs> you need to have this much. Or we're going to go hard and fast and say, of course we can, animals, protein's better. Or of course, uh, it doesn't matter. It, 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 we, don't, we, we can't, of course, anything right now. We just don't know of these types of things. So mm-hmm. we have some information there. Have you read Doug's paper? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's also, no. I mean, the... I did a Facebook post oh, about what? it. Yeah. It's really in-depth. It's basically <laughs> science. <laughs> I mean, and what Doug peer, was talking peer about Peer reviewed. <laughs> all, my, all my friends read it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all my peers. <laughs> all my other idiot coaches. Uh, so 10, 15 years ago, we're thinking about, like, plant-based proteins. We're thinking yeah. about rice and beans. And now we have... So much better. All this, all this stuff that we've discovered since then. You know, yeah. pea proteins, hemp, all these things. Right. Which are... Which aren't rice and beans. I think what's actually more interesting. They're pea and hemp. They're pea and <laughs> hemp. <laughs> but it, it does it does Uh-oh. it does make it easier to get that balance between things because when I thought about that when I when I thought about plant based proteins back in the day it was like how much protein does broccoli have in it yeah yeah and I was just like nobody was talking about you know can we can we powder down some so pea now protein you haven't even yeah. had the the discussion of bioavailability yet. And now this thing mm-hmm. gets even more complicated. And so now you start calculating numbers. Well, if I look in the nutrition label, broccoli's got nine grams of protein per serving or whatever it is. You know, it's a lot for an am- a plant. And steak's got 35. Oh, okay, great. Or whatever your numbers happen to be. Whichever favor, whichever light you're trying to make look better, you can spin the numbers however you want, right? Sure. Well, now you haven't talked about, okay, when it actually gets into my gut, how much am I actually able to right. physically break down and absorb? Mm-hmm. Now I get through. And then we haven't even started talking about what happens when you take it through different cooking mechanisms. So oh, when you yeah. cook those things differently, that you're going to have different absorption levels. This is all going to denature some of the proteins. You're going to lose some micronutrients, but you're going to gain availability of some. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even like a, a sweet potato, if you look at Penn State's lab, is they're phenomenal. They've got this nutrition, uh, food and nutrition lab, where they've looked at the, the potato, and ca- looked and saw significantly different changes in blood sugar based on the way you cook it, mash it, mm-hmm. broil it, bake it. This all has massive. Uh, <coughs> what I want to know is which one, yeah. which way it works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. And so it's just far too complex to just be like, oh, I looked at the protein, I divided it by the calories, boom, better. Like, pff, really? It's not that simple. Like, we haven't even discussed any of these other layers I, behind it. I, I, I got to redo my whole course. I'm yeah. almost think it's too. I mean, with, that, that's not for w- with that point, <laughs> it's kind of comical sometimes when someone's like, oh, I adjusted my macros by, right. by 1% and I lost all this weight. And I'm like, mm, right. That, you know, yes, that happened. And it's probably not why you no. think it happened. Not even yeah. close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also is <laughs> like I'm totally derailing and going somewhere else. Uh, but it just it's okay. We're about to wrap it up anyway. Okay. <laughs> this is this is the time to get really you know tangential. Off track. How do you say it? Um, <laughs> with what we talked about earlier is another avenue that I hear this one a lot is the the apparent confliction between doing endurance training and hypertrophy. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. And so we were going to go here. We never really got there, but we can kind of try to yeah, start the conversation a little bit where, you know, when we were all growing up, it was like, absolutely. Do not break a sweat outside of your hypertrophy training. Right. And that was all based on originally uh, at least what got the, the bulk of the attention was Hickson's classic 1980 paper. Right. Is, yeah. <laughs> Such a good read. Yeah. Fuck, <laughs> fucking Hickson. <laughs> I read it in Thor last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I assume he had oh, follow-up Hickson. questions for you. Yeah. yeah. yeah he's <laughs> a sharp cookie, Hickson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a really classic study where uh, a guy went down and he worked with a guy named John Alazi, who was the father of biochemistry for the most part in humans um, in St. Louis. And they basically, and I'm kind of cutting the story short based on time, but Halazi was a longtime runner, distance runner, et cetera, et cetera. was always giving crap to Hickson about, hey, you need to start running with me. Hickson was a lifter at the time. I was like, okay, fine. Started running with him, started noticing, man, every time I run with this guy, my bench goes down. Mm. And then they basically end up fighting, and they end up getting kicked out of the lab because of the whole thing. And he was basically like, no, this endurance training is bad for my lifting. Mm. So he launched a study where he had people do a little bit of both or a combination and found that the endurance training inhibited the strength and hypertrophy gains, but the strength stuff did not inhibit the endurance gains. All right, this is 1980. This is the launch of now our... Well, this, right. this is what... I mean, this happens all the time, it seems like. This, mm-hmm. this is the same issue we ran into with don't squat past 90 degrees. Right, right. Is people found one study... The client, right, yeah. <laughs> the client, uh, or a journalist, and right. they published uh, a whole thing about one study, and now it's it's the truth for everybody all the time. Right. So if anyone's ever citing a single study, that's... That's a sign right there. Like. Right. And then they followed that study up uh, several decades later when they actually started, they took biopsies and looked at the physical mechanisms and they were able to identify a particular protein that inhibits, that blocks the myogenic process. Mm-hmm. So that entire signaling cascade is blocked by a particular protein that comes off of AMBK that goes to TSC2 and it stops mTOR and AKT and that whole pathway. And it's actually cool. So many people are familiar with that now. Like it, signaling proteins are all hot now. So... And then I was like, okay, great. <laughs> so They're the next big thing, what, for what sure. Cir- what circles are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and Andy's universe. <laughs> totally. Peer reviewed. In Andy's world. I guarantee you. Signaling proteins are I guarantee king. you, so many of you are going to be like, yes, blood cell, I know what AKT is, idiot. <laughs> Don't play stupid for him. Mm-hmm. You show him how smart you are. <laughs> All the AMP kinase fans out there are offended. You said that. I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <coughs> um. D- dear Lucy, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're smarter than Michael gives you credit for. Um, and and so then it was like, okay, for sure, it's set. It blocks it. Don't do it. Don't do any aerobic training, whatever. And then in my my colleague and good friend Jimmy Bagley published a really nice review article. Uh, I think it came out last year, and he actually looked at all the data, and was like, hey guys, we're not seeing it. If we compile uh, all the studies that are put together, we're really not seeing this massive interference between aerobic and endurance training. And I think mm-hmm. of all sports, CrossFit has also quite clearly shown that to be evident. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, okay, look at these people at the CrossFit Games. They're not small. Yeah. And they're they're, they're only getting bigger, it seems. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we and have a spectrum. Enduring more. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No doubt. The volume's only getting higher. Right. And it's getting smaller. Right. At the games and in training. Mm-hmm. And so you have a clear spectrum. If you're running 100 miles a week, that's definitely going to have an interference effect. You're mm-hmm. not going to add 35 pounds of muscle with 100 pounds of or 100 miles of running. Like just not going to happen there. Mm-hmm. On the end, other end of the spectrum, I'm pretty sure if you did like a 400 meter jog every day as a warm up, that pretty sure that's not going to block block your gains. Like that's going to be fine. We don't know where the spectrum lies in the middle. Clearly, there is some interference effect at the far end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. But w- there's a lot of gray area in the middle. Where we're trying to figure out how much a week. And how do we calculate this bike riding, swimming, what effect, What exactly affects it? If you did a light swim once a week for 30 minutes, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't affect your grains much at all. And there's some mm-hmm. benefits to right. th- your ability to recover more quickly. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So there's a lot of fun stuff in that area. Perhaps we'll have to do a follow-up episode where we talk just about that whole, that's called scientifically, by the way, concurrent training. Like we've, we've called it different things over the years practically, but that's if you want to look at more stuff scientifically, that's the term you're going to want to go after is concurrent training. And that's next, a that's next show, <laughs> and that's effectively just developed them the the mitochondria and the ability to recover, amongst to, other things. That would be the tip the, of the iceberg. The There's yeah. a lot of other stuff going on, um, that 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 plays an Im- important role because the the biggest issue, and we could finish up here now on this mic, but it's the the fallacy of simplicity. In other words, it's thinking that one molecule in your body actually has one purpose and one purpose only. Right. When it actually has thousands. And so even if you take something like mTOR, mTOR activates growth, right? Well, it doesn't actually do that. It activates thousands of genes, well, probably not thousands, hundreds of genes. Some of them are myogenic, and some of them are, are proteolytic. And so that, that, that like, mTOR, the, the famous world AKT, the, this growth one, it also breaks you down. Yeah. 
And so it, it's just a matter of balance now. So hopefully it activated one or two more on the growth side than it did on the other side. And then what other things is it doing? Remember, we're talking about molecules here. We're not, we, we tend to personify these things and give them like, this is what they do for a living. Well, well <laughs> it's, it's like, kind of like No, uh, they're molecules. Right. They just right. do. You're watching a commercial about uh, a pharmaceutical drug. And it's like, they, yeah. they make it out to be about this one thing, and then you've yeah. got a hundred things like you're going to bleed out your ass right. by the end of it. It's like, <laughs> right. no, it's obviously doing <laughs> something more than that one thing. You yeah, know? which is generally why I take those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just, it's far more complex than that. Um, your molecules, your genes don't do one thing. There is no gene for growth. Right? There's like No gene goes, oh, you activate me, this is exactly what I do. Mm -hmm. It does a bunch of things, and we just happen to measure the growth one or something. We're like, yeah. aha! But this is also why, if, if, if it was that simple, it w making drugs would be very easy. Mm. Yeah. Very, very easy. Oh, turn on that gene. Cool. Your hair's back. Done. Yeah. doesn't work like that. Mm. So if we were to summarize everything you just said, you just said to lift weights and eat a lot of food, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I heard. L some variety. A lot of variety. Lift variety. Games. Yeah. Um, Hit all your major movement patterns. Lift, lift heavy stuff. Lift a lot of volume. Stay consistent. Eat a lot of food. Yeah. You get bigger. Yeah. <laughs> nope. Be Figured patient it out. and pray a lot. And, pray. and, and hope. hope and pray. Hope and pray. And pray. The gains. Two I scoops hope. of hope. Two scoops of hope in the morning smoothie. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> We've got it. Yeah. Awesome. Was that in our smoothie this morning? Yeah, of course. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> Every day. <laughs>